when I wake up in the morning and all I feel is guilt from yesterday's failures and yesterday's ridicules. I look to you, my God, my King, my beginning, my end, Yahweh, my salvation, my rock. I look to you and I remember why I am here, what I am here for. You have given me purpose. You call me to stand strong, to be on guard. You give me strength to get up, to move forward, and to keep going. Just keep going. It's time. I'm redeemed and I'm set free, but I won't be stagnant. I can't stop learning. I won't stop fighting. I push forward remembering the outcome, remembering the victory, the kingdom. I can't afford to waste time. I won't waste another breath. My God, let every breath be for you. Let every breath be for the lost, to share your glory, to share your hope. I am nothing without you. And I I keep fighting because you have called me to. And it's time. When I wake up in the morning, I decide to stand for you. When I wake up in the morning, and all I feel is guilt from yesterday's failures and yesterday's ridicules. I look to you, my God, my King, my beginning, my end, Yahweh, my salvation, my rock. I look to you and I remember why I am here, what I am here for. You have given me purpose. You call me to stand strong, to be on guard. You give me strength to get up, to move forward and to keep going. Just keep going. It's time. I'm redeemed and I'm set free, but I won't be stagnant. I can't stop learning. I won't stop fighting. I push forward remembering the outcome, remembering the victory, the kingdom. I can't afford to waste time. I won't waste another breath. My God, let every breath be for you. Let every breath be for the lost to share your glory, to share your hope. I am nothing without you. And I, I keep fighting because you have called me to. And it's time. When I wake up in the morning, I decide to stand for you. There was a little boy named Kyle, and Kyle was in the third grade, and, and Kyle walked up to his teacher holding his report card, and it had a big F on it. He looked at his teacher, he said, well, if I was you, I'd do something to change that while you still can, Kyle demanded. Well, the teacher thought that was a little funny, and uh, she smiled, and she said, well, why is that, Kyle? And of course, little Kyle said, well, because my dad told me if I brought home one more failing report card, someone was gonna get it. <laughs> now, when I think about little Kyle, I, I think that's kind of our mindset today, isn't it? When we look around at, the, at our world, it's always kind of someone else's fault. Yeah, the, the blame never starts with me, it, it always goes to someone else. And, and I say this too with kind of a broken heart, I think that's even the mindset in the church sometimes as well. See, when it comes to my life, it's really easy to feel like it's somebody else's problem. It's, it's not fair. You know, maybe it was your teacher growing up that, that didn't do what they were supposed to do. Maybe it was that high school coach that never saw your, your basketball talent and that's why you're not playing in the NBA today. That's a personal one right there, right? Just if you would have seen the talent in me, maybe I, I could have been something. Maybe you still blame your parents. Maybe you blame your boss, your coworkers, maybe your spouse. Sometimes we even blame God. But the fact is, just like little Kyle, <laughs> and a lot of times in a lot of situations, there's, there's a lot of responsibility that we need to take. And, and, and the hardest person to look at is sometimes that person that's in the mirror and say, hey, how can I do? What can I do? Just like little Kyle. How can I work harder to change that grade? Proverbs 19, verse 20. This is going to be on the screen, church. I'd actually like us to read this out loud together. If you're watching online, play along. Read this together out loud. Listen to advice and accept discipline, and in the end, it will be counted among the wise. 
Does anyone actually like correction? I know I don't, right? I've never met anyone that says, wow, you know what I really like? I really like it when somebody shows me where I'm screwing up, okay? It's not a fun feeling, but yet the Bible just said that's what we need to do. We need to listen to advice. We need to accept discipline. And the reason why is because there's a little Kyle that's in all of us. When we learn to accept discipline, we stop making excuses because God's desire is for us to grow. God's desire is for us to get better, and we can't do that until we learn to look in the mirror and listen to advice and accept discipline. So again, if you're a guest, we're so glad that you're joining us here today. Uh, we started a, brand, a series called Unshakable, where we're walking through the life of of Daniel. And, and if you haven't missed it, we'd encourage you to go to our website, yankton.church. You can go to YouTube. Also, we have a podcast to, to watch those messages and, and see them again. And we're talking about this guy named Daniel, who was a teenage boy who had been taken away from his home into a foreign land. And he decided that he was going to follow God. He said, I'm going to do what God asked me to do. I don't care what culture says. I don't care which way the wind blows. I don't care what's happening in the world around me. You can take my home. You can take my family. You can destroy the temple. But you will never take my relationship with my Lord and Savior. And church, I keep asking the question, who wants that kind of faith? I know I do. And throughout this series, I hope that you learn about Daniel and how we can have a life and a faith that is unshakable and an uncertain and shaky time. And in the first week, we talked about Daniel was tempted. Would he compromise his beliefs in a foreign land? But Daniel instead chose to stand firm. And last week we talked about Daniel being tested. How would he respond to the influences that he was seeing? And we talked about kind of three paths that we can choose when we're being influenced by our culture. We can choose to reject it and just say, no, I'm not going to do anything about that. We can rejoice in it. Or we can choose to do what Daniel did. And that was redeem it for God's glory. Because I made the statement... God's desire is for everyone to know him, even our enemies, and how we love our enemies, how we love people who disagree with us or see the world differently than us matters to God. And so this week, we're going to close out chapter one. And now you might be thinking, Pastor, we've gone three weeks. We're only through chapter one. You bet. <laughs> this series is going to be a slow burn where we're taking our time. We're, we're getting to know Daniel and who he is. But if, if you want to turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter one. And I'm going to be in the 18th verse, and, and as you're going there, I'm going to remind you again, if you don't have a Bible, we'd love to get you one. There's also the free app, Call You Version. It's available on any smartphone or device. If you're watching online, I encourage you to go there right now. We're going to be in Daniel chapter 1. I'm going to start at the 18th verse this time. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them and found none equal to Daniel Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. I always pause right there, right? Our pro Bible reading tip. If you can't pronounce a name, just say it with authority. Nobody else knows how to say it either, okay? Don't, don't feel bad if you don't know how to pronounce those names. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole entire kingdom. We talked about when we first started this, Daniel was probably taken from his land when he was about 13 or 14 years old. Around this time, we know he was, it was a few, about four years later, so he was probably 18 years old. You can kind of think of this as Daniel's graduation, as we're, as we're coming up to graduation season um, in our own world here. Um, talk about graduating with honors, right? Daniel would come to the office of the most powerful man in the entire world. And he would have a place, a position, and influence, and authority in this land. Man, that's a pretty good graduation, I would say, what Daniel would do. And, and I made this statement the last couple of weeks, and I'm going to keep mentioning it as we talk about this section. Not only was Daniel living in exile, I would say that we're living in Babylon today. And, and, and in the same way that Daniel transitioned from his, from his schooling now into the king's service, we have a lot of people that are doing the same thing. Uh, just to give you some statistics on this. There's 78% of adults today that identify as no religious affiliation. I'm going to stop right there. So these are people who say, I have no religious, I have no belief in God. I have no religious background. 78% church, 
grew up in a Christian home. 78% of those who say, I have no real affiliation today, grew up in a Christian home. If you don't realize that, church, we're losing the battle for our youth. And I look at these four young men, Daniel and his three friends, who grew up in this pagan culture, being influenced by this pagan king, and yet they stood unshakable. They were unable to be influenced by what the culture was saying. And we have a lot of reasons for that, right? We look at our culture today and we say, oh, there's a lot of reasons for that. But then I think about little Kyle, right? We want to blame. We want to excuse. You want to say, oh, it's culture. It's, it's those movies. It, it, it's the music the kids listen to today. How about the internet and social media? They're all influencing us away from Christ. And while all that might be true, and I guarantee some of that does play a factor into it, I just wonder if that's our way of avoiding looking in the mirror and taking some responsibility. Remember what little Kyle did? And, and I'm just going to play with this for a second, church. We, we tell our kids that you know Sunday morning is important and God, God, faith in God is important, but yet is Sunday morning optional in our own lives? Because the average Christian attends one, of, one out of every four Sundays. If you do something 12 times a year, do you kids think that's important or not? I'm just asking the question. How about reading our Bible? Not only are we in the Word, but do we speak the Word? Do our kids see us actually reading God's Word? How about how we speak about others in the home? And particularly maybe your job. I, I, I learned a, a guy by the name of John Acuff. I don't know who that is, but I heard a quote from him. I thought this was really powerful. He says, you know, I find it interesting that we complain about our jobs. Our kids listen to that for 18 years, and then they don't not excited about going out and finding their own job. And we wonder why. Because they've listened to us whine and complain for 18 years. How are your kids, what are they hearing from you? How about from their, their educators, their teachers? Are they hearing respect from you or disrespect from you? I remember this story. It was very powerful. A friend of mine told me this. That he was at home one day and he was in high school. And he was struggling with his teacher. And he and his brother were having the same conflict with his teacher. And their mom and dad were having a conversation about it. And he remembers his mom and dad speaking very ill about this teacher. They lived in a small town. Obviously, you know everybody, right? And I remember the, this guy made a statement about what his dad had said about his teacher. And, and, and the dad did something pretty powerful. The dad actually set up a meeting with the teacher. The dad, the mom, and the two boys went into that meeting with the teacher. And they sat down and the dad said, listen, I need to tell you something. I need to apologize to you because I've been tearing you down in my home. And I need to ask for your forgiveness because I want to teach my boys how to respect. And I didn't do that when I did that for you, church. I tell you what, I'll tell you one thing. My friend said he was really embarrassed when that happened, <laughs> but he never forgot it. And it completely changed that relationship with his teacher and probably for his education. And again, I just say all that to ask the question, what are we doing? What are the example that we're setting for our kids? If we want them to live an unshakable life, if we look at Daniel and his three friends, how can they grow up in that way? I I'm going to show you some things that how we can be unshakable and we can pass that on to the next generation. So if you got your note sheets, again, if you're here, on the back side of this is blank. There's a reason for that. We want you to take notes. We want you to write things down. So I hope you're taking notes, writing them down if you're watching online. Same thing. I'm going to give you four ways that we can live an unshakable life. Here's the first one. Make the decision before you have to. Make the decision before you have to. Sin is never an accident. Now, I hear people say that a lot. Well, I didn't really mean to, and I didn't intend to that, and all of a sudden, whoops, here I am. I completely disagree with that. Sin is a decision we make ahead of time. Or, or I might flip it the other way and say, sin is a lack of a decision. Because if you don't decide ahead of time what you're going to do or what you're not going to do, it will happen in the moment and you will stumble. You may have heard the phrase, if you play with fire, you will get what? Fire. That's right. So don't go near it. Why would you even play with something that has the potential to damage it? Make the decision ahead of time. We said this uh, the last two weeks and we're going to say this first one more time because I think it matters. Daniel 1.8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself. He made the decision ahead of time. There's a story that maybe you've heard before, but I think it really powerfully kind of makes the statement about how sometimes we play with sin. Back in the Old West days, Wells Fargo Stagecoach was a very popular, very, very powerful force in, in, the, in the West. They had the stagecoach from the bank, and they would run the bank uh, money back and forth across the country. 
And, and as you can imagine, they didn't have the interstate highway system we have today. They had a lot of roads that were kind of narrow and, and not the greatest. And, and the story goes that they were interviewing three men to drive the stagecoach. And the man from Wells Fargo was trying to get a hold. He said, okay, well, I want to walk you through a scenario. He said, there's one pass that you're going to have to ride the stagecoach through. It's up in the mountains. It's a very narrow road. There's a steep cliff. And off the edge, it's, a, it's about a 100-foot drop off the edge. So as you're driving the stagecoach up this mountain pass road, how close to the edge can you get? And of course, the first guy, I think he's pretty proud of himself. He said, I can get that stagecoach one foot from that edge. Well, the second guy heard this. He thought, well, I got to one up this guy, right? I want this job. So he looked at the guy and he said, I can get that stagecoach six inches from that edge. And then the third guy looked and he was a little confused. He said, well, I don't really know what to say because I have no idea how close I'd get to the edge because I would stay as far away from it as I possibly could. Who do you think got the job? <laughs> See where I'm going with that church? Why would we want to play with something like that? That, 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 that third driver had the point. Why do you want to get as close to the edge as you possibly can get? Stay as far away as you possibly can. And that's what our God is telling us today. Don't play with sin. Don't see how close you can get. Don't say, how far can I push the envelope? Stay as far away from it as possible. James chapter 4 verse 7. Boy, this is a verse you should learn. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The language of this verse is very interesting. It says, it's kind of an if-then statement. It says, if you submit to God, then you will have resist the devil. What it's saying is, is, if you make that choice that I'm going to submit to God, Satan has no authority over you. Not only will you not have to resist him, he won't even be there. It won't even be an option. Can I just say it this way? If you stay as far away from the edge as you possibly can, you don't have to think about the edge. Because you'll know where your focus is. Let me put it to you like this. Step one in being a follower of Jesus Christ is seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. You know what step two is? There isn't a step two. <laughs> That's step one. Follow God. Seek his kingdom. Decide up front that he is going to be your God. And if you don't, church, if you don't make that decision ahead of time, every moment that you're in, every circumstance that you face will be a temptation, an opportunity to fall off that edge. I've heard it said this way, you set the agenda before the meeting even happens. I love that idea, right? I'm going to make up my mind ahead of time before I even walk into the door. This is what I will do. This is what I won't do. Make the decision before you have to decide because in the moment, we're not that good. Here's the second one. Never stop learning. Never stop learning. Henry Ford said this, anyone who stops learning is old. <laughs> Whether they're 20 or 80. Here's a truth that I've learned. Maturity doesn't come with age. How many of you know somebody? If they're just sitting next to you, don't elbow them. Don't look at them right now, okay? <laughs> or even if you're married to them. Maturity doesn't come with age. Knowledge doesn't come with maturity either. I know a lot of people who have a lot of knowledge. And can I just say it? They're kind of dumb in life. It doesn't matter. If that. It matters how you continue to grow. See, maturity, and I love this definition of maturity. Maturity is understanding that there's so much more that I don't know. There's a lot that I don't know. Even at, after 43 years of life, I'm still learning. I'm still growing. And we need to have that attitude. I haven't figured it out. I haven't arrived. There's more that I need to learn. There's more I need to grow in. Look at what Daniel in chapter 1, verse 17. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding and all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. Who gave Daniel that ability to understand? It's not a trick question. God did, right? God gave Daniel the ability to understand. How did Daniel get to the point where he could have all this wisdom, all this knowledge, all this understanding? It's because he studied God's word. He knew who God was, and he learned constantly how, what God said, and what his truth was, and was what it wasn't. That's how Daniel was able to decide what was okay and what wasn't okay. Why will I do this? Why won't I do that? Because he understood 
God's word. I don't know if you know anything about the Federal Reserve here in this country, but it's our, our, our banking system. It's where the banks basically get all their money from. There's several around the country, and uh, the banks will send their money there. They'll send, they'll get new money back. But in the Federal Reserve system, I found this really interesting. In the training for their employees, they do very little study of counterfeit money. Now, counterfeiting is a big deal, obviously, throughout the country, but they do very little study on counterfeiting. What they instead teach their employees is they teach them how to study the real, authentic dollar bill. The feel, the touch, the look, the design. They study, they study, they study the real. And the reason why they do that is because when they find a counterfeit, they can tell right away. Because they spend all that time, energy, and effort studying the real. And church, can I help you with something? It's the same thing with God's word. Can we all agree that there's a lot of false teaching in the world today? There's a lot of things in our culture that, that tell us, oh, this is okay and this isn't okay. Do you know how, you know the filter we use to decide that that's true or not? God's word. But, but here's where I think we're failing because there's a study that said the average American home, it doesn't say Christian, mind you, the average house in the United States of America has 4.4 Bibles in it. And we're talking the physical Bibles, not like the online version. Can you imagine that? That's average. So there's some houses that have a lot more than that. There's obviously some that don't. 4.4 Bibles for every American household. Do you think our culture would be in a little better place if we actually opened up the Bible <laughs> and actually read it instead of just having it? Because here's the thing that makes me sad. 57%. 57% of people who claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ will say, I have read the Bible four times or less this entire year. I don't know anything that you could do four times a year and be good at it, let alone live your life and follow God. My goodness, church, do you wonder why we're struggling? Do you wonder why we're living in Babylon right now? We don't understand and we don't know God's word. If you don't want to fall for false teaching, know what God says. This could have very easily happened to Daniel. Daniel was immersed, like we just learned, in all kinds of culture, all kinds of reading, all kinds of literature. And he understood what to filter in and what to filter out. Now, I just want to go for here for a second. There might be some of you that say, well, pastor, that's not me. I know the Bible. Pastor, I, I've, I've been a follower of Jesus my whole life. I've read my Bible. I know all this stuff. I don't, I don't need to be in it every day because I understand it. I know what I've thrown. I've been to church my whole life. Well, if that's who you are, I, I want to play something with you for a little bit, okay? I want to show something to you. This is something pretty cool that I brought. This is very special to me, by the way. This is my very first Bible. Okay? Looks like it's in kind of rough shape, isn't it, right? You, you know how many Sunday school classes that I took this with and see it? And actually, as I was preparing for this, and I, and I wanted to show this to you, I actually found a picture of me with this Bible. Let's put it up on the screen. Look at me. Aww. Oh, I know what you're all thinking right now. What happened, right? <laughs> it was so cute. What happened? Anyway, this, this picture, see the little Bible? It looks a little better in that picture, right? That picture was taken in 1980. All right, so that means I was two years old. For those of you doing the math again, I'm 43. Okay, so that's, that's it. You know what I'm doing? Okay. I was two years old in that picture, and I had that little Bible. Now, why do I show you that? Okay? Because I'm 43 years old, and I, wanna hear, I want you to know something from the bottom of my heart. I still feel like I need to learn God's Word. And, and I guarantee you, whether you're in this room and you've been following Jesus your whole life or not, two years old is when I started. <laughs> you know what I was doing this morning? I spent half an hour in the book of Judges, the two first two chapters of the book of Judges had nothing to do with my message. Do you know why I do that, church? Because I need to learn God's word too. I don't stand up here because I've arrived, I've got it all figured out, I have all the answers. I feel like the more I grow in my faith, the more I get from that little guy to here, the less I feel like I really truly understand and the hunger that I have for God's word. So I hope that you understand when I say this to you. I don't care who you are, I don't care how long you follow Jesus Christ. Open your Bible. Read it. Learn it. Understand it. Grow from it. Because if I need to do it, oh my goodness, so do you. And we need to understand because we need to never stop learning. That's how we become unshakable. Here's the third thing that we need to do. We need to choose godly friends. We need to choose godly friends. One of the main reasons... Why Daniel was so successful, the reason why he was unshakable is because he had a life group. Now you might be saying, Pastor, Daniel didn't have a life group. Well, that's not might be what he called it. He might not have called it a life group, but that's what he had. 
He had his three buddies, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. I've been practicing those names with confidence so I could say those, right? Those are hard names to say. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Look at what Proverbs 12, 26 says. The righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Now, I want, I want to make something pretty clear. Not all of my friends are believers in Jesus. I, I have people in my life who are not followers of Jesus Christ because I think that God has called all of us to reach those who are far from God. And when I'm in those relationships, I can recognize pretty quickly, even if somebody says they're a follower of Jesus Christ, we'll know by the fruit, right? We'll see how they're living their life. So I have people in my life who aren't followers of Jesus Christ, but I want you to know something very clearly. And I make this distinction very well. There's parts of me that my non-believing friends will never see or hear about. Because when I'm in that relationship, when I'm in that conversation, I am the influencer, not the influencee. There's certain boundaries that I have to put up because I know that they're not a follower of Jesus Christ. And I need to make sure that I'm influencing them. I'm leading them. They're not leading me. And I'm not following. You may have heard the phrase before. You are the sum of the four people closest to you. So here's what I want you to do right now. I want you to write down the four people who are closest to you in your life. Your spouse doesn't count if you're married. Write down the names of four people who are closest mm -hmm. to you in your life. Now, then ask the question, are they godly people or not? I want to tell you, all four people in my life who are closest to me in my life are amazing godly people. Far, far further ahead of maturity than I am, and I surround myself with them. Why? Because I want to grow and I want to get better. And here's what I want to say. If you're struggling to come up with four people right now, I want to tell you this. Welcome home. <laughs> We're glad you're here. There's people in this room. There's people online. If, you, if you're watching online right now, there's a room of people here who would love to be that person for you and who would love to influence you toward Christ. This is why we talk about life groups so much. Is because we want to be in relationships with each other. We iron sharpens iron. We need to have those people in our lives that are building us up in relationships. And we call those life groups. Now our life groups have taken on lots of different seasons throughout the three years of our church. Right now, we're in a season where we're very simplifying our life groups. We basically right now have two life groups. We have one that meets Tuesday nights. And we have one that meets Thursdays at 7 o'clock right here at Cheers. So if you're looking for a group, one of those two, let us know, get connected, because that's how we grow in our faith. We can't just grow by coming on Sunday and listening to a message. It's a great thing to do, but we need to have those godly people in our life. And I'll just say this again. It takes time. I think about the people in this room that I've known, and, and some of you I've only known for a couple of years. But the reason why I know you so well is because we spent time together. Not just on Sunday, but in relationships, in life groups, and in other places. It just takes time to get to know people and build those relationships. And, and I would say that, if, again, if you struggle to write down those four names, you're probably, probably more the majority than the minority. I think there's a lot of people that I talk to in life that would struggle to write down four people who are closest to them, godly or otherwise. And we want to be that church. That's, what, that's why we love God's house. That's why we love God's churches, because we want to grow in our faith. We want to be surrounding ourselves with those relationships, just like Daniel did. His three friends, that they could really come together and be bound together, knowing that they're going to face all kinds of obstacles and problems and issues and, and evil things. But man, this core group of people, I know you got my back. I know you love me. That's the one desire that we all have. We have a desire to be loved, to be fully known, and to be fully loved. That is a human desire that God put in our hearts. And that's why we chase things. That's why we chase relationships. That's why we chase marriages. I just want somebody who's going to know everything about me and love me for who I am. Church, that is Jesus Christ. And if we're doing it right, it's his church too. That's why when you walk in the door, we don't care who you are or what you've done. Welcome home. We're glad that you're here. You can be fully known and fully loved. And that's how we grow in our faith and how we choose those godly friends. And I just got to say this again. For some of you, maybe there's some relationships in your life right now that maybe you just need to, to put up some boundaries. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying cut them out of your life. Don't, please don't hear that. Maybe you might need to. But maybe there's some people in your life where you say, you know what? Right now, I just need to not be around this person as much. And especially if you're struggling with an addiction and, and they're going down that road, stay as far away from that ledge as you possibly can. And it might hurt. It might be hard. 
But again, who do you want to be like? You know what I found in my life? This isn't in my notes, but I think it's important. I found that when I said the four people that I want to be most like, or four people that are closest to me, you know what they are? They're four people I want to be most like. Every one of those people are people in my life that I say, you know what, I want to be more like that person. And so when I'm with them, I'm learning from them. I'm not saying about me, I'm learning from them because I want to be more like those people because I see godly qualities in them. That's how we grow and get better is because we learn from other people. Here's the fourth one. And, and church, I want to say this is probably the most important one. We need to stay the course. We need to stay the course. Daniel and his friends, remember, they were taken when they were 13, 14 years old. For four years, they were ran through this program. And now they're at this graduation point, and they've never wavered at all. And, and I'm going to say this. Most people don't fail in life. I, I don't see a lot of failure in life. Most people don't fail in life. Most people just give up. And you never fail when you keep going and you keep the course. 1901, Captain Anthony Lucas was a member of the Gladys City Oil and Gas Company. Captain Lucas had suffered seven years of drilling for oil and absolutely no success. Seven years, church. What have you done for seven years and failed at? Man. He began drilling at Spindletop, Texas, certain it was an ideal location for crude oil. Lucas drilled down 575 feet. Think about that number. 575 feet. And he ran out of money. <laughs> and he couldn't go on. And, and while everyone else was ready to abandon it, Captain Lucas stayed the course. He went and he found two investors so the drilling could continue. At 1,139 feet, church, that's more than double where he was at when they stopped, right? A geyser of oil is shot 150 feet in the air. It sprayed for nine days before it was able to be under control. From that one well, it would begin to produce 100,000 barrels of oil every day, and it would spawn another 285 wells, and Captain Lucas became Lucas Oil and became one of the standards in the Texas oil business. Well, why do I tell you that story? I wonder how many dreams died 575 feet. I wonder how many of our dreams die because we get tired, things get difficult, the money starts to run out. We start listening to those negative voices in our mind. We start listening to the negative voices from our lives. And we just say, you know what? It's just too much. I, I, I can't do it anymore. And we walk away. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, church. If, if you want to memorize a verse, some of you maybe need to write this on your mirror every day. Let us not become weary of doing good. For at the proper time... We will reap a harvest if we do not give up. If we do not what, church? Give up. We do not give up. And, and I'm just going to be vulnerable here for a second. And we've talked about this before, but I, this last year has been really difficult. And, and I know for a lot of people would say this last year has been really difficult. I'm just going to personalize it for a second. This is why I think it's so important for us to be here next week at our community building time. It's going to follow our Sunday gatherings because we're going to walk through some of this. Last year was an incredibly difficult year for our church. It was for a lot of churches, but it was really difficult for our church. We went through a lot of stuff. There was a lot of things happened. And, of course, you put COVID on top of all that, and it, it was tough. And, and I was asked this question actually a couple different times. People have asked me, Jeff, did you ever think of just packing it up and just saying, oh, well, we tried it, it didn't work, and we're just going to walk away from it. Did you ever think about that? And I want everybody to look right here for a second. Not for one single solitary moment. Why would I do that? Why would I ever say, God has called me to this community. Now, has everything gone exactly the way I hoped it would? No. And you know what? I'm thankful for that. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I've made a ton of mistakes in this church. Oh my goodness. And if you don't know, man, sit down with me. I'll tell you. I've made a ton of mistakes in this church. But I'm going to say this again. I would not have changed one thing. Because it's got us to where we're at right now. And I'm pretty grateful for where we're at right now. Amen. Amen. In July of last year, I had no idea who April Hayes was. And in July of last year, I would have said, you know what, this church is whatever. Do you think we'd be sitting here today? I don't think so. And, and just think about that over those course of those six months, how this came about and what came about. Church, this is why 
I get up every Sunday morning and I'm so pumped because I know that I know that I know that I know that God is here in this community. God is here in this church. God is in his people. And I know that we were going to keep drilling. We're going to keep drilling. And, and I'm just going to say it. Someday, church, this building ain't going to hold us. Amen. It's, it's going to be a place where we, we got to. And, and I'm not saying that because I want to be. Please don't hear that. This is what I, I, I live with every day. There are people that are going to die and go to hell. And they're going to be eternally separated from their Heavenly Father. And one day I'm going to stand before him and he's going to say, Jeff, what did you do with the time I gave you? And I want to give every waking moment to reaching as many people as I possibly can. I don't get people that say, I just like a little tiny church. You know what I want you to do? And I've said this before, and i, I got to be careful how this comes across. But I, I'm praying God, this is God right now, not Jeff. This is what I've told people before. Then I want you to stand at that door. And when you get comfortable, when the, when the size is okay with you, everybody else that comes to the door, you, you look at them and you say, I'm sorry, you go to hell. I'm sorry, you go to hell. Now, that's pretty welcoming to the church, right? Let's, let's just be honest. That's what we're saying. I, 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 my church is too big. Just go to hell. We can't have that church. That's why we do what we do. That's why we're here right now. That's why we don't give up. Is it easy? No. Do I get frustrated? Yeah. Do you hear about it from me? Usually not, because I take it to God and other people. But, but I want to I understand, we've got to stay the course. And, and I'm going to bring it back to Daniel. Daniel chapter 1, verse 21. And Daniel remained there, just to kind of close out chapter 1. Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Daniel would go on to serve. Daniel was his graduation. We talked about this earlier. His graduation didn't end when he graduated. He would go on to serve 70 years for four pagan rulers and three different kingdoms. There was ups and there was downs. We're going to continue to unpack that as we walk through this series together. But Daniel never gave up. He continued to stay the course. And I mentioned this last week. Daniel never got to see the promise. Daniel was given a vision in the end. He was given a vision of what was going to happen. But Daniel never saw the return to the promised land. He died in captivity. But the nation was blessed by his faithfulness. Because he chose to never, ever, 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 ever give up. No matter how difficult it was. Stay the course. These first two weeks, I have shared with you guys that 1 Peter 5.10 has been my prayer for our church. And, and I'm going to read this again, but as I read this verse, I don't want you to hear me read the scripture. I want you to hear my prayer for you. And I prayed this prayer, honestly, this morning, as I was going through this one more time, as I prayed this to God. This is my prayer for you as a church throughout this series. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. I'm sorry for the struggles you've been going through. I know many of you, and I know the struggles you've been going through. But I'm not asking God to take them away. I'm asking that through them, God will restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Because church, it's not going to get easier. It's going to get harder. Yeah. Do you think when this room is packed, that it's going to make our lives easier, it's going to make it more complicated. Do, do you think there might be some people that might show up? Like, like we're small enough now, you probably know everybody. you think there might be some people show up that you might not have any clue who they are? we got to be okay with that, church. I, I've got to be okay with the fact that there's people that we're going to reach that I might never even get a chance to minister to. That's hard for me because I want to be everywhere and everything, right? I can't do that. we got to be all right with that, church. we got to be strong. we got to be firm. we got to be steadfast. But here's what I will never, ever, ever do. I will never compromise on God's word. I love you too much to go with the culture and go with the trends. God's word is my authority. I've made that decision. And that's not going to be for everybody, but that's okay. I'm not looking for you. I'm looking for what God's going to say, just like Daniel did. And so how can we live under an unshakable life? I'm going to go through these again, church. And if you didn't write them down the first time, here's your last chance to do it. Make the decision before you have to. Decide ahead of time what you're going to do, what you're not going to do. Because if you wait till the moment, your chances of success drop dramatically. That's not me talking, that's science. And every decision is still a decision, even if you don't make it. Because not making the decision is making a decision. 
that you're going to fall and you're going to put yourself in that position. Never, ever, ever stop learning. Read God's word. Study what it says. You will be able to recognize so quickly when there's something comes up that's not true. I hear people say stuff all the time and I go, that's not even in the Bible. Where did you get that from? That's not God's word. And that's how you recognize it is you study it and you learn. And no matter how much you think you know, no matter how little you think you know, take that time to read his word every day. Keep growing, keep growing, keep learning. Choose godly friends. Who are those four people in your life who build you up? And again, if you don't have names right now, welcome home. I'm going to put some names on your list for you. And they're going to be the people that are going to build you up. Some of you, like I said, you might have some relationships. You might have to say, listen, I'm going to put some boundaries up right now because this isn't helpful. And, and, and if there's some people that you say, I would really like to one day be like this person, give them a call. Say, hey, I want to go out to coffee with you. I want to learn how can I grow and be more like you because you're somebody who I want to emulate in life. I think we all have that point where we think, oh, they would never want to talk to me or, or whatever. Or maybe it's somebody that's famous or whatever. Give them a call. You have no idea how much people want to learn, how much people want to help you grow in your faith. And the last one is stay the course. Do not let your dream die at 575 feet. The only way, reason we know Captain Lucas' name today is because he kept drilling he would not take no for an answer. He kept going, kept going, kept going, kept going, and God blew the water out of it. Blew the oil out of it, really. And, and that's what I mean. God is a faithful God. God is a faithful God in all that he does if we stay the course. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for Daniel's example that these last three weeks we've really kind of dug down deep into this first chapter and seen how he's lived his life, God. And how he was taken away from his family and his homeland at such a tender age. And he made that decision ahead of time that he said, I'm not going to defile myself. And he had his other three friends, God, that, that would help him, support him, and rally around him. God, as we talked about last week, he didn't just thumb his nose at culture and, and form his own little holy huddle and, and just get out of everything. He said no. But he also didn't separate him. He didn't rejoice in the world. He didn't just go along with what culture said because that's what he's forced to do, God. He chose to redeem it. And God, as we learned this week, his faithfulness was unshakable. And even though he was surrounded by a pagan culture for all those years and learning about that, God, he knew the real. He knew what your word says because he studied it. He understood it. He learned from his friends. And he always stayed the course. God, let us be the same. God, let us be unshakable. We know that might cause some problems. We know it might cause some hurt. We know we might lose some relationships because of it. But God, anything that's lost for the sake of you is really gain. Because if we gain everything and we lose you, we've gained nothing. Jesus, there's nothing more important than you. And I just come back to that statement that I said before. One day, every single one of us in this room is going to stand before you. And we understand the cross and the forgiveness of grace. And we know that we're going to be in heaven with you, Jesus. We thank you for that hope. But you're going to ask us the question is, what did you do with what I gave you? And God, my prayer is that I can turn around and I can see hundreds of people that are there because of the faithfulness of the people of this church in Yankton, South Dakota at this time. And we can say that they're here now because we didn't give up. Because we continued even when it was hard. And we sacrificially gave of our time and our finances and our prayers. Because every single one of these lives matters to you. God, these are the people that we're in high beat with. These are the people that we work with. These are the people that we drive on the street with. These are our neighbors. 
These are our family members, God. These people all matter to you, and you've given us the privilege to love them and to show them how they can have a relationship with you. God, that we would be the influencer in those situations, not be influenced. God, I pray that you would give us wisdom, power, and strength to be your light in every area of darkness. We thank you and we praise you and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.